Welcome to the Binge Breakers Podcast. I'm Jacqueline. I am here to teach you how I overcame bulimia and my binge eating disorder and how you can too. Through simple steps of mind management, repairing your relationship with yourself, understanding your habits, and intuitive eating. Hi guys. Today is going to be kind of a different episode. I know I say that a lot, but guess what today is? Today is the year anniversary of when this podcast first aired. So it's today's, it's the podcast birthday today, basically. And so if you're new here and you're just looking for bleeding recovery advice, you're looking, you're kind of like, how do I stop binging and purging? What do I do? What's going on? I'm just desperate for help. This episode may not be the best for you. You'll still learn something from it, but I would go check out my first episode, How I Recovered from Bulimia Forever, and that will get you started in the right direction or just another practical episode. But if you have been following along with me for the whole year uh, since this podcast aired, then I think you might enjoy this episode. And so I wanted to give a quick overview of what this episode is going to entail, and then we will get started. So... I'm going to start, I think, by, first of all, the main the main meat of this episode is going to be all about key characteristics that um, will help you in recovery that you need to have during recovery. But we'll get into that in a second. At the end of this episode, I'm going to release something that might sound seem kind of strange, but I was fortunate enough to have recorded a coaching session I had with one of my coaches um, about when I was considering releasing, not releasing the podcast, but considering niching in eating disorder recovery and bulimia recovery. I was, I knew I wanted to be a coach of some sorts, but I didn't know if I wanted a niche. And I knew that I had this story of bulimia recovery and the coaching session, as you'll see at the end of this episode, I, sh- I recorded a short bit of it. Um, I recorded the whole session, but I'm only including a short bit of it, but it just shows you how scared I was to release this to the world. And I think it's so cool that I have that. So I wanted to release that to you guys as well, just as kind of an anniversary of the podcast. And it just shows how far not only I have come, but you know what has been created when you push through fear and you just have some courage. And the reason I thought this would be a good idea is partly because um, I think it's just cool. I think it'd be cool for you guys to see a more vulnerable side of me that I wasn't intending for anyone to see. So I just think how great is it that I have that recording when I like was being completely open and honest with myself and I get to show that to you guys. Part of what I think is so important about the podcast and believe your recovery is that you have to be willing to be vulnerable, willing to fail, willing to make mistakes. And I think this is a really clear example of me doing that and, a um, good way for me to be vulnerable is share that with you guys. Um, But then I also wanted to release these things because what I'm going to talk about today is all about key characteristics um, that you need in bulimia recovery. And I thought this would be a good year anniversary topic because it encompasses the type of attitude and person you need to be in order to recover. And the most important part about this, I think, I'm trying to get my thoughts straight, the most important part about this is when I say characteristics, a lot of you guys might dismiss it and say, well, I have none of these characteristics. And the cool part about characteristics is that they can be changed. You can develop new characteristics, new traits. Um, I, and that is why I wanted to record or I wanted to share my recording of the coaching to you at the end of this, this um, episode, because it just, if you listen to me now, you hear who I am, you've been listening to the podcast for a year. I sound like a completely different person than who was on that call. Still, you know, the same in some aspects, but I did not have the type of attitude that I have now. And it's just a living proof for you guys that you can change, you can evolve, you can become different. So the characteristics I'm going to go over today, don't just say, I don't have this or that, so therefore I can't even change. No, it's about trying to be those types of things and practicing it till you get it, till you become it. And, and sometimes those characteristics ebb and flow. Sometimes you have them and sometimes you just, you, they fall, you'll fall off the wagon of actually practicing them. So these traits are necessary, but I don't even know if characteristics is the right word for it. I think a better term for them would be skills, skills to have. And I like the term um, of skill because it implies that it can be learned. It can be built. It can be um, trained. and 
I, uh, people, um, I'm an artist, for those of you guys that don't know, I have a huge background in art. I've been drawing since the day I could pick up a pencil. When I was like three years old, I was drawing on walls, that sort of stuff. But I always used to think that I just had a natural talent for art and for drawing in particular, and some people just didn't. But something cool I learned in college when I went to art school was that um, there were students that I saw in the class that did not have a very natural ability to draw the assignments. I fortunately did, but I ran into a wall when I didn't um, necessarily have a natural talent for things because for some things, and I would struggle sometimes when I couldn't get things naturally because I didn't realize that sometimes you have to work for things. Sometimes you are good at things and you have to keep on trying until you get it right. And I would watch the students that I dismissed in my young freshman years and um, my sophomore years of college because I thought, you know, they're not very good. They're not competition. I was like looking at the world in a different lens. I was thinking everyone's like competition. And I would dismiss them slowly but surely, even though they didn't have the natural talent. Maybe they just were automatically good at something. They listened to the assignments. They practiced the drawing over and over again, kept listening to what the teacher told them they needed to correct, and they tried their best, and they got better. And some of the students that I, I spent four years with these students, it was a small art college, so I got to know a lot of them. Some of these students that were the very worst at the beginning of college with drawing turned out to be some of the best artists in the class. Isn't that crazy, right? Doesn't that blow your mind? So that's a little story for you just to share that you, especially with, I think a lot of us can see, oh, these people have a natural talent for painting or for art. Artists are just naturally talented. I believe everything can be learned. Everything can be adapted. Natural talent exists for sure, but you can also learn things. So as I'm going through these traits, please know that if you don't, you're not naturally good at any of these things, that's okay because you can, you can actually get better at them. And I am living proof of that and a lot of other people are too. And the other reason I wanted to share these um, traits with you is, or these skills is because I'm actually writing a journal. I'm making a 30 day recovery journal to release to my course members, June 30th. And that is very exciting because they're gonna be able to use it and actually go through and use the journal prompts. But part of the journal, I'm coming up with pages, you know, it's not just a journal prompt. They also read and learn along the way as they're journaling. And part of the sections in there were key traits to recovery. And I think it's so important. So this is kind of um, from inspiration from that. So what are the traits? <laughs> I've been talking a lot, rambling a lot, but what are they actually? So trait number one is patience. Recovery may not take a bunch of time. And I don't wanna say patience can be kind of like a double-edged sword because some people are like, I just have to be patient and then they don't, push themselves. They don't um, kind of try to grit their teeth and go through some discomfort. They're like, if I'm just patient enough, then recovery will come automatically. However, you have to be patient with yourself and how long it takes you to actually learn how to build new habits, to actually go through urges and wait for them to go away. It is really like, it's a very fundamental skill of recovery. It's having the patience for you to learn things, to fail at things and continue to give yourself time to do that. And when things don't immediately happen, like recovery is not immediate gratification. Us as humans, we're designed to respond to immediate gratification. Long-term things we don't think of as well with. That's why there's so many smokers in the world, right? Even though most smokers know that that's not good for them long-term, they're, they're heightening their risk of lung cancer. It's just not a good pretty picture. But because it's a long-term consequence, they don't necessarily care and they keep doing that immediate, they keep getting that immediate reward, even though long-term they know it's really bad for them. So having patience, trying to practice the act of giving yourself time, being okay with not getting immediate results, being okay with putting the work in and not seeing the immediate fruits of your labor and just have being willing for it to take as long as it takes. That's going to be super key in recovery. And I see this a lot. And I see that the people that are willing to let things take a little bit longer than what they were expected generally see a lot of the success. And in my recovery, sometimes I wasn't very patient and other times I was. But, you know, before like the year leading up to when I recovered, the final year in my bulimia journey, I had just kind of given in to the fact that I was a bulimic. And I wasn't so dramatic about it. I had been doing a lot of work on, you know, my mental health 
even though I was still binging and purging, I was doing work on, hey, we're not going to treat ourselves like shit. We're going to be respectful towards ourselves and we're going to clean up the rest of our lives. But I kind of just surrendered to the fact that I binge and purge <laughs> as a hobby and it wasn't that big of a deal. I, I kept saying that to myself because it was at least easier for me to carry the burden that way. It's at least easier to be like, you know what? I just binge and purge. It's not a huge deal. I'm not committing any crimes. It's just something everyone has their thing. And that allowed me to be really patient and almost kind of give up on the deadline and not be so desperate and thirsty to recover. And then once I actually figured out the pause method, once I realized, you know what, even though I do this, I don't really want to be doing this anymore. Um, I had gotten used to being patient with it. And then I, when I had the pause method, I finally put that into practice. That's when it kind of just clicked for me. And so it was an accumulation of me being patient, not being desperate for things to change. I learned how to be happy and patient with my life, with the way it was. And I was willing to accept, you know, the circumstances as they were, which made it so much easier for me to then recovery, of recover, I think. And that's what makes it easier for a lot of people to recover. Then um, the second trait or skill is failure resilience. And I think this is possibly the most important one, even better than patience. And failure resilience, um, this isn't my original term. I think uh, Brooke Castillo first came up with it, but a lot of life coaches use it now. And this is probably the, the, the key to success for anyone, whether you're recovering or whether you're business or whatever you're doing, whatever goal you're accomplishing, you have to be willing to fail and you have to be willing to tolerate failure. You have to be willing to fall flat on the ground, face in the dirt, things like people trampling you, whatever. You have to be willing to tolerate you falling flat on your face and then getting yourself back up. The quicker you can learn how to fail and be willing to fail over and over again, the quicker you'll get to the results that you want. Because when you fail, and when I say failure, I mean like a lot of people view the G version as a failure, even though it's not. But in recovery, a lot of people don't, they're scared to binge and purge because that means that they failed. But the cool part about failing, about binging and purging in recovery is you learn something. If you're just trying to avoid binging and purging, you're not necessarily going to learn why exactly you binge and purge. You're just trying to like hold it at bay somehow and avoid it altogether. Sometimes people just are able to avoid it altogether and it's not a big deal. And if you can manage that, cool. But I really highly suggest you be willing to fail, willing to binge and purge occasionally on accident or not on accident, but willing to um, be feel out of control so you can learn what happened. Um, be willing to overeat sometimes so you can learn how to intuitively eat. Be willing to tell someone, you know, be vulnerable and it not maybe go so well. Take a leap of faith and maybe a, a therapist or a coach or whatever. Doing something that you aren't sure what the results are going to be. And there's a good chance you can fail and do it anyway, because I guarantee you, you will learn something from that. And when I signed up for coaching before I recovered, I had no idea if it was going to work. No inkling that it was really going to be success for me. I just had heard so many good things. And I was like, I got to try something because where I'm at right now isn't really working. So I'm at least going to try. And I felt so many times. And I'll tell you, this podcast, I had no idea that it was going to be successful. I had no idea that my course was going to be successful. I had no idea if I could make money as a coach, any of those things. And I'm so glad that I was willing to fail. I was willing to put content out there and people not respond, not click on it, put a podcast out. Sometimes people respond, sometimes they don't. I've learned so much over the year through failing. And that is how you grow in life outside of recovery. And I think a side note is that a lot of these skills that I'm going to talk about today, that I'm talking about right now, they actually apply to everything. And the cool part, part about recovery is the skills that you learn in recovery can be applied to almost every component or every um, slice of your life. Um, I applied a lot of the skills that I learned in recovery to my business, to my relationships, to my life in general, to my personal life, whatever you want to say, to running, right? To exercise. It applies to everything. Failure resilience is really important. Patience is important. The third key component is curiosity. And this is uh, very uh, necessary because you have to be curious instead of responding with like frustration and just like denial and unwillingness to look at what's going on. Curious is really important, especially if you binge and purge and recovery or you start making mistakes or if you're like upset about your body, how it looks, all those things, you have to get curious about why you're doing what you're doing. And that, that really played a huge role for me when I was giving, I was just like, had surrendered to binging and purging, but I at least was like being observant while doing it. 
especially later down the road when I was kind of like, I don't think I want this anymore, but I am doing it. So why? I started to ask myself, why am I actually doing this? Like, what's going on? What was the habit here? Like, why did I binge and purge at two o'clock in the afternoon? Like, why do I always do that? What? There's got to be something going on. There's got to be something more. It doesn't just happen, right? It can't just be that I lose control of the afternoon at three o'clock in the, in, in the afternoon and every other hour of the day, I'm fine. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It will allow you to look at yourself without judgment and with a clear mind. The more you can be curious about your failures, you can be curious about the mistakes that you're making or the things that you're doing that you just aren't necessarily happy with. That's going to put you up for a lot of success, a lot of um, actually changing your habits and changing your thinking and finding out more about you. You'll find out so much about yourself if you're just curious. So having a negative thought about your body or something, being like, I look disgusting. Asking yourself, wait, why am I saying I look disgusting? A lot of people wouldn't describe me that way. What is What does that mean? Why do I so quickly go to that term? Or why do I feel the need to eat, to, to eat right now? Why, and when I'm not even hungry, what's going on? What do I actually need? Because I don't think it's food. That's all curiousness, right? Or you binge and purge. It's like, okay, why did I binge and purge? What was leading up to that? What were some of my triggers? Was it actually a planned binge or did I just start overeating, like overeating and going back for one more and going back for one more and eventually I just purge because I couldn't take it anymore? All of those things start with a curious eye. You almost have to treat recovery like you are an inspector gadget or something. I don't know if you guys remember that or if they still have that, but uh, you got to treat yourself like your inspector gadget. Your um, recovery is the mystery and you are um, Sherlock Holmes on the job, right? And you got to uncover every clue and it makes it more interesting. I know it's like hell sometimes to go through binge and purging and go through like body image and go to ups and downs, but while it's unpleasant, it's a lot easier to look at it with a curious eye and a um, kind of um, almost like an educator's or a scientist's eye, trying to find out what's the reason behind things, that will set you up for a lot of success. Um, another thing, hugely important, that a lot of us skip over, a lot of us hear this and we dismiss it, is compassion. And this is uh, very, very necessary during recovery because it's going to be hard to tolerate failure, tolerate having patience, to tolerate being curious when you're making mistakes that you don't want to make anymore. Um, if you don't have compassion for yourself, because it's really easy to turn to self-hatred, to berating yourself, to being mean to yourself, thinking that that will change things. When you are compassionate with yourself, when you give yourself an olive branch, you're much more likely to show back up to the plate. I would not want to play for a team, right? I don't want to play baseball for a team where the coach constantly beats the crap out of me every single time I don't hit the ball, right? I would be so freaking scared to miss the baseball and miss swinging, you know, that I would probably miss it anyway. Be so scared to fail, right? If I had, if I knew that the second I failed, my coach was going to call me to their office and tell me every single reason that I was a piece of crap. But that's what we do in our own minds. Every single time that we make any teeny tiny slip up, it doesn't have to be massive. We call ourselves stupid, we call ourselves disgusting, we call ourselves a waste of space, we just tell ourselves we can't get it right, that we can't even do anything, why do we even bother? The list goes on and on. You have to pull yourself back out of that. You have to, and it takes strength. It takes strength not to go to the default of self-hatred, but you have to say, no, we're an adult, we don't do this, we treat ourselves with kindness, compassion, self-respect, always. And that is something that I live and die by, <laughs> write or die by, and it has changed my life Maybe more than anything, I think, yeah, compassion, because if I didn't have compassion for myself, I wouldn't have been able to fail. I wouldn't have been able to have patience. I would have just been in a river of misery. But even when I fail now, because I still fail because I'm a human person, um, <laughs> at least I know that I'm not going to be waiting after I fail to stab myself in the back, right? I'm going to be there with some tissues and some Kleenexes and be like, okay, it's all right. What happened? How can we make it better? How can we change? How, what do we learn? You know, I'm, I'm a much more um, optimistic person to work with. It's much nicer inside my mind when I know I'm not going to, you know, be waiting with a knife to stab myself in the back. Um, the fifth thing is humility. And this kind of ties in with ego uh, and a little bit with compassion, but you need to have humility, and this heavily ties in with failure of resilience. And know that you're a person that makes mistakes. And that's just part of 
what it means to be human. I'm sorry that it is that way. I wish that none of us made mistakes, right? That'd be cool, but it'd be a pretty boring world if we didn't make any mistakes. It's part of what makes life interesting. And I think ego gets in the way a lot with all of us. We want to have everything figured out for some odd reason because we think that we'll get value from that. We'll get um, some sort of validation from ourselves and our peers if we appear perfect, if we appear flawless. But you have to have humility in your humanness, right? You have to have humility in the fact that you make mistakes, that you don't always get things right, and you aren't going to get recovery perfect. And that's a huge thing I see people do is they try to be have the perfect recovery, whatever the hell that means. They try to do it exactly right. And it really trips them up because the moment they make a mistake, they're waiting there with that knife for themselves, right? But if you can have a little humility laugh a little bit at your mistakes, at your blunders, it's gonna make it a pleasant experience and it's gonna make it easier. I think it's a trait everyone needs for all stages of life. Okay, the final trait or skill that you can learn um, or you have to practice if you're not doing a good job at it is belief. And this is by far the hardest one, I think, for people to understand or at least come to their own um, sort of belief. It's a harder one to gain and that's because If you don't believe something, you certainly, you just don't believe it, right? But belief is such a core foundation of recovery. If you don't believe that you're going to recover, if you don't believe that it's possible for you, you're sure as hell not going to try. You're not going to want to do the work. You're not going to want to even bother and lift a finger because why would you if you don't believe in yourself? And so sometimes for people, like for me, and that's why I kind of surrendered for a while to the digital version. I was like, you know what? I don't think this is going to go away. I think I'm just going to be in this. So let me just just give up a little bit and let me figure out how to make this the most tolerable thing I can have in my life. So at least it's not destroying every piece of me. Let me work on other things in my life while this is going on. And so I had kind of given up on that belief. But what helped me change my beliefs was changing my thoughts. And in particular, I started watching women, um, like podcasters, the Corinne Crabtree talking about how she lost 100 pounds. And the way she described her journey, I was like, wow, if that's possible, maybe other things are possible for me. And how she was a self-made businesswoman who makes millions of dollars, right? I was like, what? That's crazy. How could that person do it? So first I started borrowing other people's beliefs. And I started listening to really inspirational people. Like, you know, as cheesy as it sounds, listening to Tony Robbins. I know like he gets a lot of, he's very inspirational. A lot of people think he's kind of gimmicky too. But um, listening to Brooke Castillo, Stacey Bayman, uh, Amy Porterfield. I started listening to a lot of people that were not only like business oriented, but they also had a lot of mindset things to say. And I started listening to success stories of their clients too. So not only was I listening to their success stories, but I started to listen to other people's success stories. And I started looking for evidence that maybe there's more out there for me than I'm able to see or I'm able to believe. And this is why when I talked about a couple of weeks ago, you know, core or things you can do to help a loved one, I included believing in them. Because even if someone doesn't believe in themselves, they can start borrowing beliefs from other people. And I started borrowing beliefs from the people that I was following. I started thinking, wow, it's so cool that they can create all this in their life, that they have changed so much, that they've created such such success, and they're helping other people. I I wonder if that's possible for me. And I started just dabbling. I was like, I don't know if it's for sure, but I think it may be possible. And that was my first bridge thought, my first bridge belief. I wasn't completely sold that I could recover, but I started to start with the belief of, you know what? I think it's possible that I could recover. I think it's possible that I could change. I think it's possible that I could have a better life than I'm living now. And then I slowly started to believe new things. I started to believe in um, the possibility that it wasn't just a possibility, that it was actually maybe a reality closer, that maybe I was just like a few steps away, just a few months away from recovery. So if you are struggling with beliefs, I highly encourage you listen to podcasts or find other people that you think are inspirational and try to think about the fact that if it was possible for them, it's possible for you. A lot of us try to think that we're somehow like the idiots of the world and the other people who have made it or they've done stuff or maybe you've been listening to me and you're thinking, she's just, she's just different. She's just a hard worker. She just um, had a lucky go. I promise you, I'm just a normal human being who makes tons of mistakes all the time. I can be really stupid sometimes. I didn't do anything special, but I recovered. 
And if I could do it, you can do it too. And the, the core belief that I've made now that is what helps me with my clients, right? Because not only do I have to believe that I was able to recover, now I have to believe for my clients. I have to believe that they can recover too. And the one thought that I always go back to is I think they are able to recover because they're human with a human brain. And I think everyone out there listening, this is, I believe this to my bones, to my core. I am so serious with this belief. You can't change it. Even if someone doesn't recover in their life, I knew that it was a possibility for them. And here's the, here's the, the thought. Everyone with a human brain is 100% capable of recovery because they have a human brain that is 100% possible of change. I say that over and over again to myself, especially if clients are scouting themselves, like in a call, I, coaching for you, for you guys that don't know, like sometimes it's super fun, but I deal with people that are going through bulimia recovery, right? And some calls is they're very emotional, right? And they are not believing in themselves. And they're like, I don't know what's going to, I don't know what's happening. I don't know if I should have done this. I don't know if I can make it through. And I always am thinking, no, you were 100% capable of change because you're a human with a human brain who's 100% capable of changing their thinking and changing their habits. I don't for one second doubt it anymore. For those of you guys out there, if you want to borrow that belief from me that you can recover, do it. Know that it was possible for me. I'm not anything special, anything different. Okay. So those are the, the skills, characteristics you need to have in recovery. I believe all of them are absolutely necessary. It's going to be a harder recovery without those things. But you may be listening now, if you're still here, still have gotten through all these rambles, you may be thinking, okay, Jacqueline, that's great, but like, you're, I still really don't believe you. I don't believe that you were someone who didn't naturally have these abilities. But if you guys don't believe me, I really am so excited to share this with you. I have the opportunity to share with you a coaching call. This is what I'm referring to, I was referring to in the beginning of the podcast episode. This is the coaching call that made me decide to be a bulimia recovery coach and ultimately release the podcast and ultimately it led me to where I am today. And in this, this podcast episode, you can probably, you'll in this coaching call, you can probably tell I sound different. I sound a lot less confident. I sound a lot less sure. I am scared is I think the biggest thing. I'm very scared to show um, my secret to the world and I'm very scared to talk about bulimia. And I wish I had a coaching call, you know, um, <laughs> throughout, I had more coaching throughout bulimia so that you guys could maybe see that, but I don't, but this call at least shows you transformation as possible. And that's why I'm sharing it with you. I know it seems weird, it seems strange, but, um, transformation is possible. I was not these things beforehand and I still am practicing these things to this day. It's not like you just automatically get good, get good at patience or failure tolerance, and then you're good for the rest of your life. It's a constant um, work in progress is constantly going back to these skills and building them up and continuing to go through them. So that's why I'm going to share that with you. I also wanted to read before the coaching call um, a little journal entry that I had after the day I released the podcast. Um, and this is the uh, the day after that I posted the podcast that I had released on my Facebook page, my personal Facebook page to all my family and friends. Even my mom and dad, I feel bad. Even my mom and dad, my immediate family, did not know that I've been struggling with bulimia for like four or five years at that point, right? Or four years, but then um, then recovered. They had no idea that that had been going on. I kept it a secret for a while. So um, only my boyfriend knew, and I think uh, my roommate from college knew. So I was so scared. I was really scared. And I was expecting to be met with like awkwardness and judgment and lots of maybe anger and like disgust. But here's a journal entry I wrote after that. I may, may it was on May 3rd, 2020. Yesterday, I attempted, I was accepted by my friends and family in a way I never thought possible. My podcast was up. So yesterday, I finally took the leap of faith and announced it to the world. And not just on my private Instagram, where no one would find it. I'm referring to the Instagram I have now for my Binge Breakers account. Um, I posted it on my personal Facebook page and my personal Instagram. I don't know why I was so scared. I have been fearing judgment for so long. 
but people accepted it and welcomed it with open arms. People said they were proud and happy. Several people reached out privately and said my podcast helped them. I now have 35 downloads. I don't care if that's a low, if that's a low number. Those 35 people have been helped. So that was the journal entry that I wrote on May 3rd, 2020. And before we do the coaching, I just wanted to share with you guys some stats, just so you also believe that um, transformation is possible. On that day, it had been like three days since the release. I had gotten 35 downloads in three days, which I was very proud of. Since it's the full year, the full year since April 30th of 2020, uh, we have reached 68,600 downloads for the whole year of this podcast. So some people have been getting 60,600 downloads. People have been helped that many times with bleeding recovery. Numbers aren't that important. It's not, I'm not trying to like do a flex here or anything. I know there's a lot of podcasts that get way more downloads than me. Like, uh, I, and I know that, but this is really cool. And it just shows me out there that there are people that are getting helped by this. And I can't imagine where I'd be right now if I hadn't taken that leap of faith, if I hadn't just tried. And I think about the leap of faith sort of thing. I went to uh, summer camp as a kid for a long time and they had this one activity that you could do during free hour which is called the leap of faith it was a religious summer camp so it's a kind of a, kind of a biblical reference but they had this huge pole in the middle of the back the backwoods um and it was like where they're hiking or their um, wall climbing activities were there's just this huge telephone pole that they had and the leap of faith was where they would connect you tether you up and so you'd be safe with a harness and everything, and you'd climb to the top of the pole, and you would jump off. And you would be caught by the harness and everything, and then you'd be brought back down to safety. But it was just, just supposed to be a leap of faith that you were trusting that the, the harness would catch you, that you would be okay. And so I remember that I, this is a funny story, it's kind of embarrassing, but as a little kid, I, um, as a little seventh grader, I was like, I'm going to do that leap of faith. I want to do it. And I was like, I want to be cool. And a lot of my other friends at summer camp were, I don't know what they were, but all of them just weren't interested in it. They were like, Jacqueline, let's do it. Let's go do arts and crafts. So I was like, no. I was kind of a loner kid, um, to truth be told. But that's for another story. Anyway, so my activity, all my friends were out doing arts and crafts. So I was like, no, I'm going to do the leap of faith. So I went out there and I was so confident and cocky. I was like, this is no big deal. You just climb up the pole and you jump off. I watched the kid do it before me. I was like, I got this. I'm going to be even better than him. And so I climbed up the pole and like midway through the pole, I was, and I don't know how high this thing was, but it had to be at least like two stories, um, maybe three stories, um, whatever that is. I don't know how many feet that is, but it was very high. And I was like climbing. I was halfway up. And I was thinking, you know what? It's getting a little high. It's getting a little high um, in the sky. Um, people are looking really small down there. And like, if I were to fall and the harness weren't to work, this would be really scary. But I kept on climbing because I was like, I can't back out now. I'm here. And I climbed to the very tippy top of the pole, right? And I was so scared by that point that I didn't even want to stand on top of the pole. I was shaking i remember shaking i was scared my heart was beating so fast i was just terrified and i stayed on that pole guys in the top of the pole for 30 minutes <laughs> and so there were people there there are other people that wanted to go on the pole all the camp counselors were like jacqueline it'll be okay you just have to jump or you can climb back down but we can't come up and get you you have to do either or and i was i remember crying i remember being like please just get me down i don't know if i did this i don't i was just so scared i just i didn't believe at first i was so confident and then the moment i was on top of the pole i was like i it's not going to catch me this too high maybe i'm too heavy or something i don't, it's not going to work i can't do this i don't remember exactly since it was a long time ago i don't remember exactly what got me to actually take the leap of faith. But I remember thinking, they can't get me down. It's only going to be climbing down or it's going to be jumping. I came up here. There is like a one, there's a 
good chance that I will be okay. And so I, it's still shaking, you know, like put my little feet on the top of the pole. And I remember I just, I just jumped. I just took that leap of faith and I was okay. <laughs> I was completely fine. But that whole embarrassing fiasco that I just told you about, it's just to show you that sometimes things feel really scary and they're actually going to be the most exhilarating experiences of your life. So please, please, if you're thinking about recovering, if you're thinking about doing something really scary in your life, like aside from recovery, anything, whatever that big leap of faith is, I promise you just go through with it. You're going to learn something either way. That's going to make your life so much bigger. Do the thing that scares you the most because it will be life changing. So I'm going to share the recording with you. And then um, I just want to say thank you, you know, for all of you guys that I have met along the way, all of my clients, all my course members, all of you guys are amazing. And you have changed my life in ways you can't even imagine. And I'm so grateful that I have that I've had this experience and I've gotten to meet a lot of you. And I'm so grateful for those of you guys that just that are listening. And I hope that this podcast has helped you so much. And I hope that you've gotten, you know, at least 5% of the value that I've gotten back from it because it has been amazing. I'm really looking forward to another year of podcasting, another year of coaching, another year of changing and another year of more people recovering from bulimia. So enjoy the coaching call recording and I will see you guys next week. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, part of me was thinking, you know, maybe ideally your thoughts or your thoughts create your feelings. Right. But I was thinking maybe if I had a more specific offer to give people, then that would help me understand my value more. But at the same time, it's like, I'm, I'm new. There is definitely a route I want to go down later down the road, but I feel weird niching so quickly. Okay. Why? So, it's feel like it may be risky and it's kind of, uh, more of a personal topic to put out there it's um it's to help people with eating disorders so you know i i recovered from bulimia and i'm fine now and all those things and it was really through the thought work at the life coach school and understanding that this is just a habit and these just thoughts in my brain and you need to become aware of it and then and feel your feelings you can get through it um and it just like flipped a switch and you know years of horrible habits gone so I could really, really help a lot of people with that. I think specifically like food relationships, body relationships and, and eating disorders. Yeah. But, so why is it risky to have a niche? Um, <laughs> I mean, I think it, I guess I'm in the, the naive mindset that it limits who might want to work with me. Well, it does. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I was listening to you about, podcast this morning and she was saying the reason I chose you as a coach was because the story of how you described food relationships that was my story and I'm like this is this is why and you should be so helpful so because yeah. when you talk about your niche of helping people recover from bulimia or from bulimia or eating disorders whatever mm -hmm. exactly you would say now I know exactly how you're going to help me. You have like an exact offer that you can make that I see is valuable because I know what result you're going to help me create. Right. Right? Yes. So whether or not you do a niche immediately, you can make that decision for yourself. Just make sure you love your reasons. But the reason why people get to the place eventually or in the beginning the reason why people pick a niche is because then they can very clearly communicate how they're going to help to that specific person right 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 so, and, yeah i guess i just need to take the leap and i think i feel a bit embarrassed about the fact that i went through it i think that's mm -hmm. that's something in my head and like i'm using i'm transferring my personal Instagram into just my business Instagram because I don't really want to hide what I'm doing from my friends and family anymore uh, because that's going to be my initial pool of <laughs> maybe potential customers and getting my name out there but it feels really weird to put it out there you know that I struggled with this for so long and you know only people close to me know about that so it'd be kind of weird why would it be weird 
I mean, I just, I just, um, sorry, I didn't expect to get emotional on this call. Um, I'm just fearing the judgment from other people, I guess. Yeah. So that's your work to do to, to notice that those fears, your thoughts about what other people will think, the judgment, all of that, like that's your work to do in order to own that story so that you have your own back. And then when you share it, you share it vulnerably, but you're in charge of how you feel. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I feel like I've asked coaches about this before and I still am struggling with it. Like how do you get past, I mean, I guess the answer is you just have to feel the fear and do it anyway. Right. What's the question? Um, how do I overcome um, the fear of judgment from other people? How did you get past the urge to throw up your food? Um, I became aware of when I was on the road. I first stopped judging myself. And I first stopped telling myself I'm, I'm a bad person and I'm crazy. Um, And then once I realized it was really just a habit, I I looked at it as like just drinking a Diet Coke, quite honestly. Um, And then I became aware of when I was going down the automatic habit. And I became like, oh, I think I'm on the route to a binge and purge. And then just that awareness helped me to finally be like, oh, do I really want to do this? Mm -hmm. And then I I finally stopped identifying with someone. I don't even like calling myself bulimic because that's not true. I am not that person. I was just someone who did that. Mm -hmm. so how could you apply those steps what you have already done because getting over disordered eating changing that eating pattern that's hard as hell that like takes a lot of strength and you did that so how can you apply those steps that you practiced to the pattern, the habit of caring about what other people think? Um, I mean, I must think my fear of judgment is just a projection on how I feel about myself. So again, stop being the first person to judge myself when it comes to what I'm trying to do in my life. Um, And then, sorry, I'm thinking through it. <laughs> and then, uh, I think, I think honestly, just accepting that judgment will come and that I'm not gonna die. I, like the going out into the world and and hoping that no one's gonna judge you or reject your opinions or tell you mean things or scoff at you, you know, and think you're a waste of time, is really not a good. It's really naive, I think, because people are always going to tell you things that you don't want to hear. So you got to expect it at some point and just think like you don't have to believe what they say. Mm -hmm. And then to become aware of it and accept it. I think those are the things that I'm going to have to do. Yeah. So first, letting go of the judgment of yourself, what you're worried about other people will say. I'm just repeating back to you what you said. I'm going (laughs) to echo it back. Okay. So first, letting go of the judgment of yourself, what you're worried about other people saying to you, are they haven't said it yet, so it's really just your thoughts, that, the way you're judging yourself. Yeah. So first, letting go of that. And then noticing that it's not like who you are or like some part of you. It's just a habit that you have that you care about what other people think. That's just a thing that you're doing right now, yeah. right? Creating that awareness around it, noticing that other people's words are just thoughts that they think, and then you get to decide what you want to believe. And just like you explained with your other the other pattern that you changed, noticing when you are about to go down that judgment hole, right? Noticing when you're about to start engaging with it, 
and checking yourself and being like, is this what I want to do right now? Is this the habit that I want to reinforce? Right. Yeah, those right. are really good questions. Because, I mean, I think, I feel like the bulimia was just so obviously not a healthy habit for me, um, even though I guess it's neutral. Uh, but this one, it doesn't always seem so neutral. It doesn't seem like it's so obviously bad to judge things because that's what humans do. <laughs> yeah. But it, I mean, judging myself so negatively, judging myself constructively is better, you know? There's there, It's one thing, I think, to look at yourself honestly and... Yeah to evaluate like what's working well, what's not, where can I improve, right? I mean, I guess that's a judgment because you're like making decisions, but that seems like a different thing than thinking like someone's going to criticize me. There must be like something wrong with me because like someone is going to have thoughts about me or I have thoughts about me. Like that's a different type of judgment, Right. right? Yeah. I think to bring it back to your business, whenever you're ready to niche, I think it is easier to explain exactly the value that you bring because you're telling like, this is who you are, this is your problem, and I can help you solve it, right? Right. But even if you're not ready, even if you want to take a minute or two or 10 to coach yourself before you come forward with exactly your niche that you want to work in, you're still, even when you're offering free sessions, you can still think about like, what is the result? What is the value that I create with my free client during this session? Or if they were to hire me, how can I explain to them the value of the result that I'm going to create for them, right? Right. That's why having a niche is so helpful because you know exactly what their problem is and you offer them the solution when you're offering like general life coaching, like what solution are you offering? How can you frame that in a way that that is valuable? Right. And that would, that would be so much easier for me for sure. I just need to get over what we just talked about as well. Because that I'm always like, I get it. There's so many solutions I could offer people for so many things and that's great. But like, it seems like I'm always all over the place. Yeah. So, but you have your own personal story. You have, like a true um, like before and after that you can share with them. And you're like, look, I know exactly where you were because I was there. I know exactly where you are because I was there too. Like I can help you create this after. It's a lot better. Like you can show that value really well. Yeah. Yeah. We all have to get over our own stuff, right? Like if we're going to like let ourselves be out there in the world it's this is just the work we all do and it's not that you have to get all the way to the point where you like don't care about anybody's opinions before you can start like i think you can also let yourself like wade into the pool like start in the shallow end and then you build that strength just by doing it too right yeah i mean there's no way i'm gonna be able to get used to it unless i go out and do it like i know that intellectually i just need to practice it Well, thank you. I don't, I'm sure we're like pretty, yeah, we're We're right right there. Thank you so much. Nice talking with you, Jacqueline. Have a good day. You too. Hey, if you like this episode, you have to come check out the Binge Breakers Recovery course. If you're trying to recover from bulimia and you're sick of doing it alone and you feel like you've tried a lot of traditional therapies and it's not working with you, come join the course. Go to bingebreakers.com slash recovery dash course.